My name is Duncan Black, and I want to talk about why equivalence is not the answer when it comes to financial services. The UK's financial services industry is not only very important to the UK economy, it's also extremely important to the EU economy. The last available figures show that around 40% of UK net financial services exports go to the EU. The UK securities market is the biggest in Europe. The UK banking sector is the biggest source of cross-border lending to EU banks and corporates, with more than 1.1 trillion of loans outstanding. Overall, as a financial centre, despite Brexit, London is still far bigger than any other European financial centre. In fact, according to the Global Financial Centres Index, London is number two in the world behind New York. And the next biggest European centre is Zurich at number 10. And as you might have noticed, Zurich is outside the EU. The first EU city in the index is Luxembourg at number 12. Despite this, UK exports of financial and insurance services to the EU have been generally falling as a share of total exports. And this was during the period when the single market was supposed to be becoming more integrated. With the emergence particularly of Asia, the centre of gravity is moving away from Europe and London and towards Singapore and other Eastern financial centres, particularly in China. Many have predicted that the absence of a deal regarding financial services in the UK's Brexit withdrawal arrangements will prompt a severe decline in the fortunes of the City of London. The loss of the financial services passport is seen by some as a major blow to London's future position as a financial centre. Some pin their hopes on equivalence as a substitute for the passport to try to fill the gap. I recall the debates in 1999 when the euro was launched and when, wisely as it turned out, Gordon Brown resisted pressure from Tony Blair and pro-Europe Conservatives to join the euro currency union. At the time, it was predicted the UK economy would suffer as a result of not abandoning the pound. These predictions turned out to be completely wrong and it was a blessing the UK was not in the euro during the difficult period from 2008 to 2014. More recently, gloomy predictions about an exodus of financial services business and staff from London made in 2016 when the vote to leave was cast have proved wildly exaggerated. So, are the predictions about loss of the passport similarly incorrect? I don't know the answer to that. Ask me in 10 years, but I would say for now, the position is much more nuanced than some would argue. So what is the difference between passporting and equivalence? Being a member of the EU gave the UK single market access rights through passports and the presumption of regulatory equivalence between the UK and EU. So what are passports? It means the right to passport certain financial services across the EU, either on a cross-border basis or through local branches, without the need for additional local regulatory authorisations. Those rules limit the extent to which member states can impose additional regulatory requirements on businesses using their passport rights. These passports are not available to firms from third countries, i.e. firms based in countries that are not within the UK, as the UK now is or isn't. Even without the passport, UK financial firms, just like, for example, American firms, are still able to set up local branches and subsidiaries if they wish to continue to provide services in other member states. But this may require significant investment in terms of capital, staff and infrastructure and may involve moving some of it from the UK. For example, last year Lloyds Bank terminated 13,000 of its customers in Holland, Germany and other countries because it wasn't worth the trouble and expense for them to set up locally regulated operations in those countries. But for other banks such as HSBC, NatWest and Santander, it was worthwhile to keep serving European customers. The policy think tank Open Europe report in 2016 analysed the importance of passports. It's important to remember the financial services passport is not a single passport covering everything. Instead, there are a series of sector specific passports based on the relevant financial regulations. In some sectors like banking, the passport is important, but in other sectors it has much less value. The loss of the passport could be more damaging to some sectors than others. The report looked at those in turn. 
First, banking. The passport was most significant in both wholesale and investment banking. Around a fifth of the banking sector's annual revenue was estimated to be tied to the passport. The passport in banking was also a two-way street, with a number of large EU banks making significant proportions of their revenue in London via the passport. In 2016, Deutsche Bank, for, existence, for instance, earned about a fifth of its revenue in the UK. The second area they looked at was asset managers. Passporting worked less smoothly for asset managers, given that a number of technical barriers existed to marketing funds across the EU, for example, supervisory and legal fees. Many of the larger funds already chose to operate European subsidiaries rather than relying on a passport. It was always the case that the UK was much more open to UK asset managers than the reverse. A large chunk of EU asset management assets are already kept in funds domiciled in Dublin and Luxembourg, with fund management, as opposed to administration, delegated to the UK. Assets under administration have largely already migrated to places like Dublin or Luxembourg, but this is not the high value work. Administration is middle or back office work. The location of the managers, commonly in London, is more valuable. That's the front office work. There have been recent attempts by the EU to crack down on delegation by European funds to asset managers located in London. The third and last area the report looked at was insurance. Insurance is a more global industry. 28% of insurance exports went to the EU in 2015, compared to 44% for financial services in general. There isn't really a single market in insurance in the EU. The vast majority of insurers operating across borders in the EU do so via subsidiaries rather than branches lumped on the passport. The loss of the passport. Well, Theresa May's withdrawal deal, which was rejected by Parliament, largely preserved the financial services passport for UK companies, provided the UK regulatory regime followed the same rules as Europe. This is one reason why it was voted down. The UK would remain a rule taker, but would no longer be a rule maker. So what is equivalence? Some EU legislation allows non-EU firms to provide services into the EU if their home country regulatory regime is equivalent to EU standards. Equivalence sometimes also requires reciprocity. For example, in relation to the European market infrastructure regulation, known as EMEA. The activities which allow for the possibility of equivalence cover a very limited range of services and provide fewer additional rights than passports and may also be subject to additional conditions imposed locally. For this reason, equivalence is in no way equivalent to a passport. Unlike an EU passport, the rights under equivalence regimes can be withdrawn at any time if the equivalent country deviates materially from EU standards. EU legislation generally requires that the European Commission makes the determination of equivalence, but in some cases this may be left to member states or their national regulators. Although there are 42 areas of potential equivalence, they are very narrow and sector and activity specific. So, for example, there are no areas of equivalence for payment services providers or e-money issuers. As to insurance, there are only a few very narrow areas of equivalence for insurers permitting reinsurance, but direct insurance is not within the scope of the equivalence regime. In relation to banking, there is no equivalence available for most banking activities such as deposit taking, lending and payment services. The UK has found the EU to be equivalent in all 42 areas, but the EU has only made one temporary equivalence decision in favour of the UK so far. This decision recognises UK clearinghouses as EU equivalent so that EU firms can use them for derivatives transactions. That's because the EU had no choice, because without access to the UK's clearinghouses, EU businesses would suffer a huge drop in their ability to trade derivatives. This proves the point that when equivalence is declared by the EU, primary beneficiaries are in the territory that grants equivalence, not the territory that receives it. Going back to the financial centre league tables, you can see why no EU state has any incentive to grant equivalence to the UK in the future. Common sense, this is not going to happen. So what's the conclusion? 
Well, there's no doubt that there are short-term disadvantages to UK financial firms and their EU customers caused by the loss of the passport. We've seen examples of that in our own client work. But if we look forward into the medium and long term, I think the global trend shifting capital away from Europe and the increase in size of non-EU investor pools and businesses requiring investment make the loss of easy access to EU markets for UK financial firms using the passport far less of an issue. The real action is increasingly elsewhere, away from Europe. And London needs to focus more on capturing business from those sources, perhaps ahead of those EU cities which are currently focusing on competing with each other to catch the immediate short-term fallouts from London.